Hello Physics 30s. In today's lesson, we are going to start on the next unit of study in Physics 30, dealing with light and optics. And for today's lesson, we're going to specifically focus on, one, describing quantitatively the phenomenon of reflection, two, explain qualitatively various methods of measuring the speed of light. So for that learning outcome, we're going to look at a bunch of experiments that were performed in an attempt to figure out what the speed of light was. And then three, calculate the speed of light given data from a Michelson type of experiment. And the Michelson experiment is going to be the one that actually did result in a, an accurate value for the speed of light. To start the unit off, we're going to look at different light sources and some basic observable properties of light, starting off with the sources. There's basically two ways that we can see objects or, or view light. One is you could simply just look directly at a light source. So for example, in this picture, this little circular object is some kind of light source. And I'll talk about some different light sources in just a moment. From a light source, we have light being emitted in every possible direction. And we show that by drawing a bunch of these lines that have arrows on them. These lines with arrows are called light rays. If one of these light rays or a few of these light rays hit your eye, then you can actually see the light source. So a few examples of this might be the sun, stars, a light bulb. Uh, let, let's talk about a light bulb. A lot of old school light bulbs would have these tungsten filaments in them. And if you heated the filament up to a specific temperature, the filament would get so hot that it would begin to emit visible light. That's called an incandescent light source. You also have fluorescent light sources, which would be most of the horrible lighting in the school. In those fluorescent light sources, like you have these tubes that inside the tubes, you have some kind of gaseous vapor. And if you put an electrical current through that vapor, you can cause it to glow. Phosphorescent light sources. Well, best example of that would be going back to the cathode ray tube experiment that was discussed in the previous unit. If you have high energy particles interact with the phosphorescent light source, so that would be like the cathode ray tube screen coated with phosphor, you can actually get the screen to glow. You also have chemiluminescent and bioluminescent light sources which there's some kind of chemical reaction that occurs with one of the reactants being visible light. Bioluminescent would just be the reaction, the chemical reaction occurs in, in a living thing, like a firefly. In terms of like the sun and stars, you'd have like some major type of nuclear reaction, which we'll discuss in more detail in the last unit of the course occurring, where once again, one of the reactants is visible light. The other way that we can see objects is light hits the object, it reflects off of it, and then it goes into our eye. So for example, uh, I have an object in this picture. Again, it's just a circle. This object could be a textbook. So a, a textbook on its own is not a light source. The way I can see it though is light from a source. So that could be like the, from the awful fluorescent uh, light source inside the classrooms would come from the light source, hit your textbook, and then reflect off of it and then go into your eyes. So the way I'm able to see the textbook and the words on the page is a result of light from a source hitting the book and then reflecting into my eye. It's a more indirect way of actually viewing things. And the other examples I've given right here is light reflecting off of a mirror light reflecting off of a whiteboard, light reflecting off of a planet. So the picture shown down here could be, your light source could be the sun, light rays from the sun hit another planet, and then they hit that planet and reflect back to us. And if we're viewing it through a telescope, we might be able to see that planet. In terms of basic observable properties, we'll look at three of them. First basic observable property is that light travels in straight lines. We represent this on diagrams, as I showed on the previous slide, as a ray of light. And all a ray of light is, 
is a straight line where you have an arrow somewhere on the line that tells you what direction the light is, is moving or what direction the light is being emitted. There's a couple of ways we can justify or that light does travel in straight lines. So evidence from a, a couple things we can observe. One, the fact that light can cast shadows is evidence that light moves in straight lines. And two, light does not append, appear to bend around corners. Okay, so I'll just give like a really simple of example of this. So let's say we have the ground, which is that horizontal line and the wall, which is the vertical line. We have a light source somewhere on the ground. And we're going to put an obstruction between the light source and the vertical wall. That light source emits rays of light in every possible direction. We're only going to focus on a few of them, though. So here's one ray of light that comes from the light source. It hits that obstruction. And depending on the color of the obstruction, objects that are black tend to absorb light. Objects that are white tend to reflect it. As for the other colors, well, there's certain, it depends on the nature of the material. Some, some objects will absorb certain colors. Some objects will reflect them. The reason an object appears red is because it would reflect red light. Okay, but anyways, light from the source is emitted and it hits an obstruction and it's either going to be absorbed by the obstruction or it's going to be reflected. Second ray of light, same thing. It's emitted from the light source. It hits that obstruction and either gets absorbed or it gets reflected. Let's look at the ray of light that just passes through that top little corner. If we extend that line of the ray of light that just passes through that top corner, that shows me the size of a shadow that would be cast. And I suspect that you've done a lot of mathematical problems. I'm, I'm not sure in which math course where you've had to predict the size of shadows using some uh, some basic uh, geometry, which I can come back to in just a moment here and talk about after I talk about the second observable property. Number two, light rays obey the laws of geometry. This is a consequence of the fact that the light travels in straight lines. So different laws of geometry that they could obey would be similar triangles, trigonometry, the law of reflection, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. But just going back to this picture, again, like you could set up some similar triangles. Like, for example, if you want to figure out like what the size of the shadow is being cast, then you'd have like one really big triangle here. You have like a smaller interior triangle, which I'll just pick with, I don't know, let's do light blue, smaller one. So for example, if you knew what the distance from the light source to the obstruction was, and you knew the distance from the light source to the so the wall was and you knew what the height of the obstruction was you could make a prediction as to what the height of the shadow would be I'm, I'm not going to show that though or you could apply some right angle trig to to do the same thing we'll focus more on the law of reflection because this is, this is going to be something we need to use moving forward in the next lesson when we talk about reflection off of curved mirrors We'll start off with the most simple type of problem, which is we have a reflecting surface that is a plane mirror. A plane mirror means it is flat, it is not curved in any in any way. So let's say we have a light source and we'll focus on one ray of light coming from this light source, which we'll call the instant ray of light. When this instant ray of light hits the surface, so it hits the surface at this spot, we're going to draw something called a normal line. A normal line is just a line that is perpendicular to the reflecting surface at the point of contact of that incident ray of light. So my normal line would just be a vertical line that is upward. 
if we measure the angle between the instant ray and the normal line, that is called the angle of incidence. And we'll use the variable theta one to represent the angle of incidence. What the law of reflection tells you is that the angle of incidence relative to the normal line is equal to the, ang the angle of reflection also relative to the normal line. So I'd measure my theta two value, which is equal to theta one starting from the normal line. And that would allow me to predict what direction the reflected ray of light would move. So theta two would be the angle of reflection. And your law of reflection, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, tells you that the angle of instance theta one is equal to the angle of reflection theta two. So that's another law of geometry that we can apply to light and optics. Three, this is what we're gonna focus on in more detail in this lesson. In a specific medium, and when I say a medium, a medium is, is kind of just like a region where you have uh, maybe perhaps a uniform density. So like one medium might be water at like a certain temperature. Another medium might be air at a certain temperature. Another medium might be empty space. When you're in one of those media, light is going to travel at a constant speed in that specific medium. Do you have a couple of examples? In the vacuum of space, which means there's no particles in that region, or in air, the speed of light to three significant digits would be 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. We use the variable lowercase c to represent the speed of light specifically in a vacuum or air. And as you know, this is really, really fast. I think the way I think about this is the speed at which light travels is that I think in one second, light could travel around the earth seven and a half times. So it's, it's very, very quick. Any medium that's denser, such as water, because you actually have particles in the medium that are more closely packed together, the speed is slower. So in water, and by no means do you need to memorize this number, we'll look at the law of refraction where you can calculate this later on. The speed would be slower, and it's 2.26 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. we're going to do now is we're going to look at a series of experiments that attempted to figure out what the speed of light value is. So we're trying to aim for that 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second value in air. We'll start off with an experiment, a very futile one performed by Galileo. Galileo attempted to find the speed of light in air by measuring the time required for light to travel a known distance between two hilltops. Okay, I'm gonna to try to illustrate how this experiment worked out. Okay, so let's say we have a hill and on the hill is Galileo. And he is going to be holding a lantern. I cannot draw a lantern. I'll just draw some red in it to indicate there's some fire or something. Okay, so he's got a lantern. And then, some distance away, we have another hilltop. And on this hilltop, we're going to say that Galileo has an assistant. Now, the assistant is also holding a lantern. Again, we'll... Just draw some red inside of here. 
Now, here's the idea behind the experiment. So initially, these lanterns were covered up. So there's something on top of them. So Galileo would not be able to see the light from his assistant and vice versa. What Galileo tells his assistant is that, okay, I'm going to remove the cover from this lantern. And the instant I remove the cover from the lantern, I'm going to start timing. And then what's going to happen is... We'll do this in like a different color. Right after I remove this lantern, the cover from the lantern, light is going to travel over to you. And Galileo's instruction is, okay, as soon as you see the beam of light, I then want you to uncover your lantern. And then when he uncovers his lantern, beam of light is going to go back. And then once Galileo observes the light returning to him, he stops timing. So here's what we have. And I'll do this once again in a different color. So let's say this distance is D. Again, the idea is Galileo tells his, his assistant that I'm going to pull the cover off the lantern. Light's going to go from my lantern to you. Once you see it, I want you to uncover your lantern and light's going to go back to you. And I'm just going to measure how long it takes the light to go from you all the way back to me. So what he's going to do is he's going to measure, he's going to measure that time. And the idea is we use the uniform motion equation, V equals D over T. Well, in this case, because the light's traveling to the assistant and back, that would be two times D. So if we know the distance between the two hilltops and then just divide by the time it takes light to go to the assistant and back, we can figure out what the speed of light is. Now, I'm, I'm sure you're already, you can already come up with a reason as to why this does not work. I mean, I already mentioned that the speed of light would be in one second, light would go seven and a half times around the earth. The problem right here is that time would be so insanely, like it would be so insanely small. Like the light goes so quickly to the assistant and back. There is no way that Galileo can measure that. In fact, even think about this, if you had like a stopwatch and like you took the stopwatch and started and stopped it as fast as you possibly could do, I guarantee you that your reaction time would actually be greater than the time it would take light to go from Galileo to his assistant and back. So there's just no way that this can be measured. The human component is a problem because of the human reaction time. So futile experiment. And what does this experiment tell us? Well, not much. It tells us that light moves really, 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 really fast. Not even that, though. From their perspective, like, it could be moving infinitely fast. Like, when you see light, it's just there. Like, it's not like you see a beam of light slowly crossing over the hilltop region coming towards you. You don't observe the light until it actually has reached you. So at this point, we don't even know if there's a limit on how fast light can be. So for all we know at this point, it could be infinitely fast. So the experiment seems ridiculous, but it's not totally ridiculous. If we can remove the human element out of it, it might be okay. And we're going to come back to this idea when we get into the Michelson experiment. Second scientist. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Ol Romer. I'm going to go with Romer. A little bit of a different setup. Now, he didn't actually do an experiment to figure out what the speed of light is. What he did is he made an observation about Jupiter's moon Io and specifically the period of Jupiter's moon Io. Jupiter has a bunch of moons. Io is probably like the most common one people talk about. It's like a volcanic nightmare. Uh, I believe the period of Io in terms of how long it takes Io to go around Jupiter. It's somewhere around, I think, 42 hours.
So all Romare is doing is he's just sitting and observing, well, how long does it take Io to go around Jupiter? So again, if we had Jupiter, here's Io. Just want to know how long does it take Io to go around Jupiter one time? That would be the period of revolution. And he notices that depending on the relative motion between the Earth and Jupiter, this period changes a little bit. If we're in a scenario where both the Earth and Jupiter are moving away from each other, this orbital period is a little bit larger. Now, not significantly larger. Like, I'll make up some fake numbers. Like, perhaps when the Earth is moving away, the orbital period of Io is just a little bit bigger. So maybe like 42.1 hours. And he also notices that when the relative motion is such that the Earth and Jupiter are, more, are moving towards each other, this orbital period is smaller. So maybe it would be something like 41.9 hours. So it's just, it's just slightly underneath the 42 hours. So what we notice right here is there's a little bit of a time difference between the orbital period of Io when the Earth is moving away from it and towards it. In this situation, this, this time difference, which I'll call delta T, be really, really small. It would be like 0.2 hours. It's probably even smaller than that if you actually did like the, the correct calculations, not the fake numbers. Okay, so that's all Romare observes at this point, that depending on whether the Earth is moving away or towards Jupiter, the orbital period of Io changes slightly. But he didn't actually do anything to figure out what the speed of light is. Our next scientist, Christian Huygens, who we'll come back to later when we talk about Huygens' principle involved in explaining how diffraction works, he basically took Romare's idea and was able to take that idea and then do something to figure out a value for the speed of light. Now, he still focuses on Io, but instead of measuring the orbital, uh, the orbital period of Io, he just simply observes when Io first appears from behind Jupiter. Okay, let's just quickly explain like, like how we would observe this. So in this diagram, obviously in the direct center, we have the sun. And then this blue circle here and here represents the earth. So on this side, this is when the earth is in its orbit closest to Jupiter. On the left-hand side, this is when the earth is in its orbit as far away from Jupiter as you can get. The way that we see Io is we need light from the sun. So let's, let's just draw Io here. We need light from the sun to travel all this way across empty space. It hits Io, whoops, wrong direction here. The wave ray should be pointing in that direction. It hits Io and then it reflects back to the earth. Okay, that's how we observe Io. We need to the light from the sun hits Io, it reflects back, and then if we're using a telescope, we can observe when Io first appears behind Jupiter. When it's behind Jupiter, we can't absor ob observe it because the light rays would just hit Jupiter. But once, like when it just comes out from behind Jupiter, we're interested in that first ray of light hitting Io and then bouncing back. What Huygens reasoned is that there should be a time difference for when Io was expected to first appear based on where the Earth is in relation to Jupiter. So let's say that we're at this point here. We're at the point where the Earth and Jupiter are as, are as close to each other as possible. And let's say that Huygens is observing the exact time that Io first pops up behind Jupiter. And I'll just make up a fake number. We'll say it's like 12, 12 a.m. Okay, so he makes that measurement. That's when Io first appears from behind Jupiter, when the Earth is closest to Jupiter. Okay, so then sometime later, the Earth is 
on this other side here is as, it's as far away from Jupiter as possible. And then we, again, determine, well, what time is Io going to appear from behind Jupiter? Now, what happens, and this is the difference between the two positions, is if we compare the position of the Earth here compared to the position of the Earth there, and once again, the way that we see light from Io is, if this is Io, light from the sun hits it and bounces back, then the light is going to travel to the Earth. If it's at this closest point, the ray of light would stop here. But if it's at this furthest point, and I'll draw this in a different color, so I'll extend the ray in a different color, then it would keep going. In terms of why there is a time difference, so when I'm on this left-hand side of the circle, well, why would the observed time not be 12 a.m.? Well, look at this purple arrow. It's because light has this extra distance to cross. So when the Earth is furthest away from Jupiter, there's a bit more of a distance for the light to cross so it can actually be observable from us. So I would expect maybe, because light has to cross this extra distance, the time to be a little bit later. So perhaps we'd observe this at 12.01 a.m. Again, I'm just making up the numbers. So we look at these two, these two numbers, once again, there is something called a time difference, okay, which we can call delta T or we can call T. So there is a time difference based on whether the Earth is in its orbit closest to Jupiter or furthest away. And the reason that time distant difference exists is because there's an extra distance light has to travel. Now, if you look at the actual picture, what is that distance? Well, if I draw like the radius of this or this orbit here, we could call that RE. By the way, I'm aware that the orbit of the Earth around the sun is not circular. It would be an elliptical orbit, in which case we just take the mean orbital radius. So this extra distance that the light would have to travel across would be two times this mean orbital radius. So this would just be equal to two times R to perform a calculation now so we can go back to that uniform motion equation v equals d over t or in this case we'll replace v with c because we're trying to calculate the speed of light the d would be the extra distance the light has to cross when comparing the earth closest to jupiter and further furthest from jupiter so that's two times the earth's mean orbital radius the time would be well, the time to cover that that distance. So the time to cover that distance would just be this time difference delta t, which in this case would be one minute. When Huygens actually calculated this, he got a numerical value that was 2.38 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So there's a good and a bad thing about this calculation. The good thing is that, well, first of all, it's a number, like it's a finite number. So we know because if I'm further away from IO in comparison to being closer to it, because it takes longer for me to observe when IO pops out, the light has, the speed of light has a finite value. It can't instantaneously travel from one point to another. So we have a finite number now. We know that light does not travel infinitely fast. I suppose the other good news thing is we're on the right magnitude. So the speed of light in vacuum is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. We got that part. The bad news is this number here, 2.38 is closer to the speed of light in water compared to the speed of light in air or a vacuum. So it's still quite a bit off. It's not totally, it's, it's not totally accurate. I'm not sure like what the reasoning is for why this is not accurate. Uh, I mean, the model on the, on the, on the PowerPoint screen isn't entirely accurate. I mean, the assumption in the model here is that as the Earth moves around its orbit, Jupiter doesn't move at all. And it is true that Jupiter has a much slower, or uh, it might have, sorry, I should say it has a much larger orbital period compared to the Earth. 
I think the orbital period of Jupiter is somewhere around, I want to say like 12 years. So it would take half a year for the Earth to go from one side of its orbit to the other. Jupiter would move a little bit around that time, but not a whole lot. So maybe that accounts for some of the error, but I suspect a lot of the errors had to deal with uh, not having sophisticated enough pieces of equipment to properly measure it at that point in time. And the final experiment is going to be the Michelson one. And this is the one that's going to give us a an accurate value for the speed of light. The Michelson apparatus for this experiment involves using a rotating mirror with a certain number of sides to it, where the number of sides we're going to use the variable lowercase n to represent it. Here's what the apparatus looks like, and I'll, I'll go through it and then talk about how we can figure out what the speed of light value is. Okay, so I think this was performed somewhere across like a mountain range. So what I have is on one mountain, I have this plain mirror. It's stationary. And then 35 kilometers away, I have this rotating mirror. So in this case, it's, it's a mirror that has eight sides to it. And it's rotating in a direction from our perspective that would be clockwise. So these two mirrors are located 35 kilometers apart. What I have at the bottom is a light source. And again, what that light source does is it emits light rays in every direction. Just draw a few of them. Beside the light source, I have this little slit here. So what the slit does, and if I extended the slit, I'll just draw it in a different color. So I have kind of like this wall with like a really, really tiny opening. So what that means is only one of these rays of light is going to pass through. So that's that one that would be directed towards the top of the page. Only this ray of light goes through. What happens is this ray of light hits the mirror. And then according to the law of reflection, angle of instance is angle of reflection. They would hit the mirror, reflect off of it, then reflect off this mirror, come back and hit a different part of the mirror and then reflect off of it, and there would be an observer waiting to see if they can actually view any light. Okay, so that's kind of the gist of how it works. You just have light hits a mirror, it goes all the way across this mountain range, reflects off the mirror, comes back, and if it comes back at a very, if it hits the mirror in a very specific manner, then I can observe the returning light. The observer will only view the returning beam of light if the mirror rotates at a very specific frequency. Okay, here's what I mean by the, for the very specific frequency. So I'm going to label a few sides of this mirror. So let's call this side one. We'll call this side two, side three, side four. What I need to do is in the time it takes light to travel across this distance, which I'll represent with, with green. So in the time it takes light to go across this range, reflect off this mirror and come back. I need the mirror to have rotated in a way so whatever orientation that it started with, it's back to that exact same orientation. So for example, if the ray of light hits side four, in the time it takes light to go across the mountain range and back, I need these sides to have rotated so that this guy would now be side one, this one would now be side two, and this one and now be side three. And it needs to be back in that exact same orientation. We have the observer sitting here so he can only see the reflected light if the light hits the mirror back in this exact same orientation. What we need to do is figure out, well, what frequency would I need to rotate the mirror at to do this? 
So I'll make up a fake number. Let's say that the period of the mirror is, I'll make up a number. I'll say 16 seconds. It's got to be way faster than this. The period of the mirror, that's the time it would take for this mirror to go around one complete revolution. So if this was side one, the period would be the time it takes for one to go all the way around back to the same position it started off with. Now, I don't need the mirror to go through a full revolution when this beam of light goes across the mountain range and back. I only need to have it so that, again, let's label these, these numbers. We'll go four, three, two, one. I only need to, to have it rotate so that when that ray of light goes across the mountain range and the time it takes the ray of light to go across the mountain range and come back, I need to have, this is now side four, this is now side three, that's now side two. So how much of a revolution has the mirror gone through in order to do this? Well, it has eight sides on the mirror so the time it would take the mirror just to go through this, this revolution where side three is now side four, that would be one eighth of a revolution. So the time to do this would be 16 divided by eight, 16 seconds divided by eight. So if it takes 16 seconds for the mirror to rotate around in a complete circle, two seconds would be the time it takes for it to go through a, an eighth of a revolution, one eighth of a revolution. So the mirror is back to its, I shouldn't say back to its starting position, but back to an orientation that's identical to what it started with. We can be more generic about this. If I want to actually write down the time, the time would just be equal to the period of the mirror. Time it takes to go around the circle one time divide by the number of sides on the mirror. So little t is equal to the, the period of the mirror divided by n. Okay, let's try to figure out how we can calculate this now. So once again, we'll start off with the uniform motion equation, which tells me that your speed of light c in air is d divided by t. In this case, we're looking at light hitting the mirror, going across this mountain range and coming back. That's roughly just two times d. In the time it takes light to go across the mountain range and come back, we need the mirror to have rotated through one eighth of a revolution. Or if we want to keep it more generically, we can just say the period divided by n. So one nth of a revolution, depending on the number of sides in the mirror. If I expand this, then the number of sides of the mirror would go to the top. And that would be one way of calculating the speed of light. If you knew what that distance was, you knew the sides of the mirror, and you knew what the, the period of the mirror was, then you could calculate the speed of light. I did, however, identify in the second bullet point we're talking about frequency. So I can kind of pull the equation apart a bit and just focus on the 1 over t part. And it turns out 1 over t is equal to frequency. Frequency and period have an inverse relationship. Therefore, an equation to calculate the speed of light from a Michelson type experiment would be two times D, D be the distance between the two mirrors, times N, the number of sides in the mirror, times the frequency. And it turns out when Michelson did this, and this took like a long time to get this done right, we did get the correct value, 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. I did want to point out that this essentially is the Galileo experiment. So in the Galileo experiment, we had like one hilltop, we had another hilltop. Really all Michelson's done here is he first of all remo removed humans because we can't deal with any reaction time. For a mirror, when light hits it, it just hits it and bounces back. The mirror doesn't need to think about, oh, do I want to reflect the light or not? It just happens. So we remove the human element. And the rotating mirror is introduced as a clever way to figure out well, what's the time it takes the light to go across that range and then come back? So this is the most accurate experiment and the one that most of our calculations will focus on dealing with the a Michelson type of experiment. All right, so that's the end of the lesson. And 
you can complete the assignment called Speed of Light. And then next time we'll get into talking about the optics of curved mirrors. Talk to you then.